The U.S. doesn't have all the answers, trust me. The AI is not going to take over humans. I That's believe the future is belong to artificial intelligence. We don't have all the answers. So always be open to any. Yeah, and watch out for technology, especially for global health. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have an amazing guest, Tayyib Azahir from Battlefry Network USA. Welcome to our podcast, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You are welcome, ma'am. Ma'am, why you choose medicine? Like, why not something else? You can be something else, but you choose medicine. Why? Right. Um, global health, public health specifically. Um, for me, I think growing up when I was young, um, you know, with a father who was in pharmacy, I always liked the the subject of health, healthcare in general. Mm. Um, so I did do like pre-medicine in my undergrad uh, in the U.S. Um, because I just love the subject. I like learning about the body. I like learning about our health and how it impacts our lives. Um, and then specifically, I got into public health. Uh, when I was, when I entered um, undergrad, like college in the U.S., uh, I started in the hard sciences and medicine. Uh, but I realized that, you know, something was missing in that and I was more interested in health at a population level rather than an individual level. Mm. Um, I like to see how your environment, your choices, um, the, the built environment around you, uh, other social determinants like income, uh, education, how that impacts health because I feel like that really provides a holistic view. And then also, uh, you know, growing up as a daughter of Im Pakistani immigrants in the U.S. and always having the relationship with Pakistan, you know, coming back every couple of years, um, you know, I always feel like I saw the world in a very different way from my peers in the U.S. You know, I just saw it from an outside angle, from a very worldly view, um, instead of being in just a bubble of where I live. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, made me very interested in public health and specifically global health because, you know, local is global now. The world is so small and the things that we do in our home is actually impacts and Im impacted by the things that are happening around the world. So that's kind of how I got into public health and global health. And ma'am, do you think you made the wise decision that you choose public health. Yes, I definitely think so because I really enjoy what I'm doing now and I'm the type of person I can't stick to one thing, you know? Mm. Like I have to, um, you know, dabble into different things because I have so many different interests. And so mm. public health allows me to do that. There's so many ways that you can go. You can go to the private sector, you can work for government, you can work for a healthcare system, mm. farm, pharma, um, there's just so many ways, programming, evaluation, policy making, policy advocacy. Making. Uh, exactly. And so I like that I have options. <laughs> mm. And you can explore different options as well. Exactly. Ma'am, as a health equity advisor for the main CDC Office of Population Health Equity, mm -hmm. what are the most significant challenges you encounter in promoting health equity? Yeah, I think. Um, Health equity means something different, obviously, based on the community you're talking about. So in the U.S., we have a lot of inequities around race, around income, around mm -hmm. the neighborhood you live in. It really impacts your health care outcomes, unfortunately. And so, um, you know, I feel like people think of equity as an afterthought. Like first they'll do all the work and then they'll be like, oh, we need to be equitable and add this thing and serve this marginalized group. But I think the challenge is, is convincing stakeholders that equity is a part of every single part of the process of mm. your programming or whatever you're doing in public health. So, for example, at the main CDC, we talked about, um, you know, the data life cycle mm. and how to bring equity into data, because if you don't have equitable data, you mm. won't be able to make equitable decisions. Exactly. And so it, and, you know, we realize a lot of people think about equity after the data is collected hmm. right instead of thinking about equity in the data collection process hmm. are you hitting all the marginalized groups are you collecting their data are you approaching them in a way where they are comfortable with sharing their data with you hmm. all the way through analysis reporting and then dissemination of data are you disseminating the results back to the communities that you took the data from you hmm. know so that's an example of 
you know, incorporating equity across every step. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of stakeholders, it takes time for them to realize that, right? And then the second challenge is actually implementing equity. What does that look like? We like buzzwords, right? Mm -hmm. We like the buzzwords of equity and, and whatever, justice and all of this kind of stuff. But what does that actually mean on the ground? And whenever you do anything on the gr ground, it requires funding. Hmm. And, you know, getting that funding and then implementing it uh, into actual programming is always a challenge. Exactly. Always a difficult part. Yeah. Ma'am, you have had a role in partnership coordination with WHO and other organizations during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about the importance of collaboration in global health? Yeah, I mean, it's as you are now <laughs> as well in global health collaboration in G4 yeah, Alliance. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we we heard um, the president of the board of the G4 Alliance say today, you know, we're stronger together. And, you know, it's literally as simple as that. I mean, the more minds you have coming mm. together for something, you are just going to be better than exactly. you are alone. And, um, you know, that is really important. I think, um, you know, something that people you, you need to be careful about mm -hmm. is that it's actual tr true collaboration it's not just one entity telling another what to do because mm -hmm. they think they're superior exactly you know, as long as there are no you know harmful power dynamics and there's true collaboration mm -hmm. that will always be better than you know a fake outer collaboration when you know internally it's actually just a one-way thing mm -hmm. exactly yeah Amazing, ma'am. You <laughs> explained it really well. Ma'am, with your extensive background in epidemiology, public health and technology, yeah. what do you think are the most exciting trends in global health in, in this upcoming year in, yeah. the, in the era of artificial intelligence? Yeah, so technology is the number one thing. I mean, there is just a boom in technology right now and it's just going to go faster and faster. Exactly. Um, and I think technology within global health seems for people to be uh, like a far-fetched con concept, mm. but the technology now is becoming easier, mm. easy to learn, easy to adopt, and that is perfect for global context in low resource context. There's technology that lowers, um, you know, the barrier of education, you know, or, or the amount of, tr uh, you know, formalized training that would be impossible for some, you know, mid-level healthcare workers are now attainable using technology that has AI specifically, mm, you know, exactly. and like AI that has been researched and obviously, uh, you know, approved, uh, you know, that will do wonders for low resource context um, because people are, you know, in, in developing technologies, uh, you know, it's not now just about some advanced technology that you have to have like years of experience or you have to already be a developed community mm. it's not about that anymore there's a lot of technology that you know is is making it easier to use it's making it you know easier to adopt um and utilize for various dis different things including point of care ultrasound exactly. um, which is just making it easier to um you know utilize a diagnostic tool but not only that but just empower clinicians empower um you know the people that are using the technology and that's really what technology should be it should be a form of empowerment that so that you can make your own decisions using your knowledge um you know this is just an additional tool additional tool and i think you know yeah watch out for technology especially for global health because mm. you know there's a lot of great developments out there and then a second thing i would say um it's sustainability and the concept of sustainability. Mm. It's really exciting to see um, how much people are taking that into consideration, especially with climate change and making things eco-friendly. Mm. So now you will see, you know, programs aren't being developed just to develop a program uh, or to go to a place one time and do one thing. But people are really thinking now in the global health world about how to keep it sustainable over mm. time. Uh, how to keep it sustainable for the people that are actually doing it um, and then how to make products and programs eco-friendly. Eco-friendly, exactly. Yeah. Ma'am, you explained really well, but I have to ask another question yeah. related to technology. Yeah. I believe the future is belong to artificial intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> so what your thoughts on this that how we can use artificial intelligence in healthcare system? Yeah. Like we need to equip ourselves 
with artificial intelligence. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I attended a talk recently where they said it very well. You know, AI is not going to take over humans. That's mm. just not possible because mm. we program AI to do whatever it needs, mm. right? Uh, but the people who use AI exactly. will take over the people that don't. Don't. So now is the time to really uh, start incorporating AI into your practice or else you're going to lag behind. The exactly. people who use AI are going to get ahead of you. And mm. that's just how it is. You know, we're going to keep developing technology and the people who don't use it are going to fall behind. And so I think in the healthcare world, clinicians are very slow adopters. Exactly. Right? Because yeah, that's they love the point. to stay in their, in their zone. They're exactly. like, hey, what I'm doing works, you know, and they to think about novel and innovative new techniques or technologies. It's hard for them to adopt because now they're like, oh, dang, like I have to <laughs> learn this whole new thing. Exactly. I had all this, you know, education before and I have to like learn this new thing. But hey, the clinicians that are using these technologies and tools, mm. you know, they will now have time to do the other things. So you use the tool to gather the information. So, for example, in point of care ultrasound, you use ultrasound to just for image acquisition. So you can see in the body, you can get that information. So then then you use your knowledge um, to make decision from that. And mm. that's where I think training is going to be moving to. Mm. Right. Because doing getting the image or doing the work is going to become easier with technology but now you get to focus more on the problem solving so what do i do with this information how do i apply it what are the next steps and you know that's where you know i believe clinician clinicians will be spending their time um and it's really important i think to adopt ai is coming whether you like it or not <laughs> exactly technology is developing whether you like it or not so might as well hop on it while it's still early mm. and just continue moving with the flow of how the world is going. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, ma'am. Yeah. Impressive answer. Ma'am, looking back at your career, what has been the most rewarding experience for you till now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think any time where I get to see the impact of what I'm doing, like and I get to talk with the people on the ground that's mm. most rewarding for me mm. so my past um my past positions my past jobs were like epidemiology jobs very like data I was behind the computer either it was like reporting or data quality I was in the numbers mm. and it was hard for me to see what the impact of that was mm. right and in my current job I literally speak to people from around the world mm. every day who are literally on the ground doing the work and implementing ultrasound or like using the ultrasound or um, you know just doing the work on the ground and that's I think very fulfilling for me because I get to see that because public health is a thing and this is what all public health professionals need to understand is like you will you will have an impact everything you're doing mm. you know will have an impact we it, you just won't see it right now because exactly. public health is a long game to see the grand impact it is a long game it's and just I think like a marathon exactly it, it's a marathon not a sprint right and so uh, you know that I have to keep that in mind, but obviously when I get to talk to the people on the ground, that's, you know, more rewarding for me than being at, you know, this high level where all everyone does is talk, <laughs> but we don't actually <laughs> hmm. do the work. Do the work, exactly. Ma'am, what advice would you give to those starting out in public health programming? Yeah, the ad advice I would give is, is you know, really be open to doing anything, especially in your early career days. Um, you know, don't wait for that, you know, opportunity that you've been dreaming of. It's not going to happen in your first job. It's exactly. not going to happen in your early jobs. Um, you know, take jump on opportunities that you're given because it came to you for a reason. You know, mm. it's it, it was written for you and you jump on it. And um, there will always be a way where it can connect back to the work that you want to do, mm. you know. And it will also give you a unique experience, yes. you know. And so later on down the line, when they see that you've been working, you know, this random job or that you really came from the ground mm. up, exactly. uh, you know, that will be more valuable mm. than, you know, people who don't have that and jump straight to the top. And so always 
you know, jump on any opportunity that has been given to you and be very open minded in your career. Yeah, uh, you know, don't be picky. Just go for it and keep going because naturally you're going to get into exactly what you want to do. Uh, but with a very unique set of experience. It was such an amazing uh, answer you <laughs> gave it to audience and to me. Ma'am, what's your final thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the world is really rapidly evolving, especially within public health, global health medicine. Um, and we really, again, have to just be very open minded to the hmm. changes. Exactly. We have to, uh, you know, flow with the world um, and, you know, just being very open to that is really, really important. Hmm. Um, you know, always challenge your own beliefs. You know, you don't have all the answers. Exactly. You only have, you know, the answers to your own experience, which mm. is very valuable. You always have something to give in a mm. space, um, but you don't have all the answers. And especially in the U.S., what I always say is like, we need to get rid of our Western superiority complex. Mm. The U.S. doesn't have all the answers. Trust me, the Western world doesn't have all the answers hmm. you know the answers will come from a collaboration hmm. of of the global world and when we think about healthcare we really need to put that in perspective and exactly. we need to be you know vessels for best practices from different areas so that we can learn from each other um, and so always be a global citizen is what hmm. I tell people and you know evolve with the world uh, and be very open-minded <laughs> wonderful ma'am amazing <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> you thank you so much, ma'am. You are. We did such an amazing conversation, specifically you. Thank you. And it was thank pleasure you. talking to you. Thank, thank you so you. much, ma'am. Thank you.